So last time we looked at a couple of approximate inference methods. Um, this one was exact for multi-label MRFs if we have convex potentials. Then we looked at one which was approximate but worked with arbitrary potentials. And then we found, we saw one that gives us uh, at least uh, partially, uh, it gives us at least partial results, um, but not, you know, complete results for the NP-hard multi-label MRF problem. And today I want to discuss an important complementary method, which will give us exact results on arbitrary graphical models, arbitrary except they have to be tree-structured. So exact map inference and tree-shaped MRFs. And in particular here, the potentials need not be convex or submodular. And the method is called belief propagation. I will start by again introducing the stereo example because it's been a while since we met, so that uh, we all remember. So I associate each pixel in my image with one random variable. And I introduce pairwise factors that encourage smoothness. So I prefer similar labels over dissimilar labels, and I have unaries that couple to the to the observations. And this graph goes on. I've just shown a tiny part here. And for the stereo example, we have here hidden labels, xi, and these are discrete. They can take values 1, 2, 3, up to some maximum value d. And I've written D here for disparity because we have a left and a right image. And if an object is far away, it will appear in roughly the same position in the image uh, after they have been pre-processed, aligned, and so on. If they are close by, there will be a large disparity. So I have here the unary data term, which in our case can be given by the cost volume that you've, you have computed yourself. Our cost volume is indexed by the pixel position and then by the disparity value. And in the context of the MRF, I'm uh, writing here potential psi, which depends on the one hand on the hidden label, and then on the observations, typically not on the entire image, but just on a small part of the image. And like the name says, this gives me 
the cost of assigning disparity xi to pixel i. And secondly, I have these smoothness terms and a typical one in stereo would be the following. I could say that I want a penalty for zero uh, of zero if I have the same label in two adjacent pixels. I have a cost of C1 if they differ by a depth of say 1. So xi equals xj plus 1 or xi equals xj minus 1. And I have a cost of C2 otherwise. So if I want to draw it as a matrix, I would have 0 along the diagonal and C1 along the first off-diagonal and then C2 everywhere else. And note that this is not a convex potential. Uh, if I draw it Penalty of 0 if the adjacent pixel has the same label, penalty of 1 if it differs by 1, and then constant penalty otherwise. So this is non-convex. And Bayes' theorem tells us the following. So the probability of some label assignment given the observations is proportional to the likelihood of the observation given the labels times the prior probability for the labels themselves. So this term here would be the prior or the smoothness prior and that one is the likelihood or the data term. Okay, and in this picture here, I did not make this pairwise term depend on the observations at all, but I could do that. Um, for example, if I detect an edge in the image, then I could multiply um, this penalty with 1 minus the edge evidence and that means a label transition would only be expensive where I have no edge evidence. Uh, but that changes my model. Uh, at that moment my prior also starts to depend on the observations and I do not have a true generative model any longer. Uh, as I've written it now, I have a complete generative model. I have an MRF. If I did make the smoothness term depend on the observations also, it would be a conditional random field, a CRF. You had a question. Is that a what? That's a proportional, not an alpha. The thing here? Yeah, proportional. So this was as a bit of a reminder for the kind of problem that we're actually trying to solve. And But in the title I said that uh, we will do exact map inference on trees. Yeah? So right now I will uh, step back a little and not even look at a tree but at the simplest possible thing uh, beyond a single node, namely at, at a single chain. So we look at the chain of random variables and 
and this model here you know it looks pretty primitive but actually it's not a purely academic exercise because one of the best stereo algorithms of our days best if we take into account how good are the results and how expensive is it is an algorithm called semi-global matching and it actually uses this very structure that I'm showing here as a for its basic operations so I have my unary and my pairwise potentials and so on okay and Now for this uh, map inference here, we want to maximize, so we want to find both the value and often more interestingly the configuration of random variables that maximizes um, the term that we saw above in the, in the Bayes theorem. And the dependence on the observations is actually often omitted. Yeah, so in the following lines you will not see the observations explicitly any longer. But they are hidden in the potential. They are hidden in the example that I gave here in the unary potential but I'm going to omit this O in, in the following equations. So I want to maximize over x the probability of x. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, it's dirty notation, but I'm omitting the O here. And if I write it as a Gibbs measure, this is e to the minus the energy of x, and I can take the logarithm of this or any other monotone function and then I can write that I want to maximize minus the energy of x or I could equivalently say I want to minimize the energy of x. Um, today I will talk about maximization and that will introduce lots of minuses everywhere. Uh, I do that because it's often called max product belief propagation. So I'm maximizing over all of my random variables and here are the many minuses that I mentioned. And here I wrote a maximization jointly over all random variables. I could also say that I want to maximize over x1, over x2, and so on. The same expression. And now I will come you know, to the crucial line of, uh, of today's lecture, namely that I don't need to uh, let each of these maximizations run over the entire expression, but I can apply each maximization only to the terms it depends on. Yeah, so let's see this maximization over x1. Um, how far I can push it in. 
Um, or the way I wrote it above, let me start with xn actually. So I have a maximization over xn of the following. These are the only two terms that involve my variable xn at all, and so I can push in my maximization. Uh, I can push it way back to the place uh, where the terms actually depend on xn. Okay, and uh, so this will now be a function. It still has a dependence on x minus 1. This is now a function of xn minus 1. And now previously here I had a minus psi n minus 1 of x n minus 1 and a term minus psi n minus 2 and n minus 1 oh sorry I need more space And this is where I want to let my maximization over xn minus 1 act on. The result will be a function of only xn minus 2, and so on. And at the very end, I have my maximization over x1. So this is the most uh, crucial line of today. Uh, replacing this joint maximization over everything by a series of maximizations only over the variables in the scope of that operand. And this trick is so crucial because up here I had <clears throat> I had a single maximization over, if I have d disparity levels, then it's a maximization over d to the power of n possible configurations. So this is number of disparity levels or number of labels to the power of uh, the number of nodes that we have. And down here, I merely have n nested maximizations, each of which goes only over d elements. So one grows exponentially in the number of nodes, and the other one is linear in the number of nodes. So this is a huge simplification. Um, however, at this point, okay, 
let me write it down first okay it's a huge simplification that that we have this is very nice <clears throat> but it gives us only the actual maximum value so it tells us what the optimizing energy is but not it does not tell us the labels of the random variables that actually gives rise to this most uh, desirable energy so at this point in time we know this maximizing energy E of x star <coughs> but we don't know the arc max so what we need to do is to keep track which maximizer of my first function here gave rise to the maximum of my next function of f of xn minus 2, etc. This, uh, so we need to do some bookkeeping here, and we can achieve this uh, bookkeeping by, uh, when we do these uh, maximizations here, um, to keep track not just of the maximum value but also of the argmax. can store this information in an array so we will actually need two arrays later um, I will have an array M for maximum which tells me so this has D rows and it has N columns and in this array I can I can store all the maximum values that I had found. So for example, I had started by evaluating here this function depending only on uh, x n minus 1. So I can put the um, I'm thinking if I need n columns or n minus 1 columns here.
No, I do need n columns. Um, so in here would be uh, if I take the result from this innermost maximization, would be the actual values that I found in this innermost, innermost maximization for the d states that my variable xn can take. So um, these are discrete numbers that I can store here. And What I now want to store in a second matrix, a matrix A, is the information if I now look at the maximizers in, uh, for the next random variable, um, which one actually gave rise to a particular maximum. Yeah? So it, uh, it could be that, for example, the lowest value in this last column was this one, but if I now consider all paths that lead to the, max, uh, to the maximizer of the next column, which is this path and this path and this one and this one and this one and this one and this one, it can be that the path which actually led to the maximizer of the second column was from a different element. And so on. So each column will have its local maximum, but it will also have uh, taking into account all the uh, previous maximizations, it will have some particular value that overall gives us the maximum. Yeah, so this is something like a cheapest path algorithm. Okay, and what we can read off now, the thing with the bold black line here, this is the global or the overall maximizer. And it's important to understand that this global maximizer, global maximizer is not the same thing as the collection of the local maxima. So in our case this global maximizer would actually be a one-dimensional depth map. So these You see, there are there are many possible paths um, leading, for example, to this point here, and so on. But uh, the one that I've shown with this bold black line is the one that is overall cheapest, and um, we will find that in a forward pass. So this is um, the forward pass. We will find that by always keeping track of the connection that was the cheapest one to reach a specific point in a column. And at this stage, we don't yet know which is going to be the overall best path. Right? It could be that there is some other path which initially looks very promising, but then eventually runs into a dead end, uh, meaning a very high energy configuration after the first few steps. So which one was the overall best path? We can only establish after the backtracking stage. So let me say this in words, this array M that I've tried to draw here is filled successively
and it holds for each element where element is so for each state of every random variable the maximum sum of rewards that can be collected or the minimum penalty that can be collected along any path reaching that element. But if we want to know which specific path it was, we need this backtracking step. I will give you pseudo code and then ask for your questions. So for the forward pass, we have a loop from one to the maximum number of labels and we initialize the first column of this matrix so here I'm writing the first previously I did the nth maximization first you know but it's, it's the same either way And now we have a loop over all remaining nodes. Where we store an element Li of this matrix following maximum so we have the previous maximum the cost for the transition and the cost for the current element. Okay, so let's look again in the picture above. Um, if I if I want to know um, what is if I now want to know what is the best uh, value leading up to this point that I've just drawn, I can either uh, transition from here or there or there or there or there or there. And in each of these cases, I need to take into account the previous maximum, then the cost for making this label transition or not, and then the data term at this very pixel. Okay, so those are the, turn, uh, the terms that we have here. So this gives me the overall reward of the best path leading 
to state L in pixel I. And now we also need to store this information, where did we come from? So I'm writing capital A here for argmax. And it's the same expression. And this gives me uh, the last step or the last link of the most rewarding path to state L in node I. Okay, and so we loop over all columns in this matrix. And once completed, I can do the backtracking. So this was the forward pass, and now comes the backtracking. The way I've written the pseudocode now, I started with the first, I started with maximizing over the first random variable initially and then over the second and so on. So the last element of my path is the largest element of this last column. And now link by link I trace back this best path that has been leading up to that element. Excuse me, x star of i minus 1. the beginning. Okay, and as a programming paradigm, this entire thing here is an example of dynamic programming. Dynamic programming has two prerequisites to work well. One is that we need so-called optimal substructure in the problem. Meaning that um, the solution to a part of the problem is also part of the solution of the entire problem. How do I put that in words? Um, The optimal solution of the partial problem is the partial solution of the global problem. What I mean by that is the following. Uh, if we again consider this optimum path that I previously sketched. If I ask for the best path which starts here and ends there, then there are many other possible paths that have that starting and end point. But the best possible amongst all these paths must also be part of my globally optimum solution. Because if there was a different one, <coughs> So let's assume that the blue path here was cheaper than uh, the right half of the black one. Then I should change my global solution to also 
trace along that even cheaper path. Okay, so this is what I'm uh, trying to say with this uh, statement here. This is what, what is meant by optimal substructure. And secondly, we need a property called overlapping subproblems. which means that the global problem decomposes into partial problems that have this optimal substructure property. Okay, now I'd like you to stare at this piece of code and see if you can connect it to the sketch that I made above and if this makes sense to you. And if you have questions. So the crucial formula was this one here instead of doing all of these maximizations jointly we did the maximizations one after the other and this is what uh, as long as we have a single chain is this is what this pseudocode here accomplishes so we do the maximizations iteratively we have two loops one loop over the labels and an outer loop over the nodes so um, for each node in the chain, we compute the best way to get to a particular label, given um, the maxima that we had previously found. And we also store in this forward pass the information of how did we produce this maximum that we saw. And then we use that in the backtracking stage to finally find the joint solution of all, or joint configuration of all these random variables that gave us this lowest cost or the greatest reward.